So if you ask people outside of the church what Christianity is all about, they probably would tell you it's boring. <coughs> it's boring to be a Christian, right? I mean, a lot of times people, uh, they don't just flock to church. They don't want to just hear the pastor preach. And there's a ton of different reasons. But if you ask people what Christianity is really all about, you'll probably get a, a bunch of mixtures of, of, of reasons or, or explanations. And really, if you boil it down to a, you know, a few words that you can kind of sum it up with, it's really, to most people outside of the church, it's all about rules and restrictions, especially college students. Like, man, Christianity ain't nothing but a bunch of rules and restrictions, right? Because people aren't just like, man, a relationship with Jesus? That's awesome. I can't wait to, like, go to church on Sunday. Oh, my God. Dude, this is going to be so awesome. Like, you know, that, that's not the response. If that would be the response, they'd be flocking to church. I mean, churches would be packed every single Sunday. Um, people would just love to hear the pastor. They'd bring their Bibles. They'd be attentive. You know, the world would be in such a better place. But... Unfortunately, it's not how it is. So I want to kind of give you guys a few examples of what I think. These are just, you know, my, my, my perception on, on how I, I see conversations I've had and even my own perception in the past of what I thought Christianity seemed like. So just use a few props, a few examples. I'm a youth pastor, man. You've got to entertain students. So, you know, I work with middle through high school students. So if I use elementary examples, just go with me. Smile, nod, like <laughs> preach, preacher, preacher, white boy, whatever you got, you know, get shared. It's fine. All right. So, so. Here we go. So a few ways of how people see Christianity. And the one way is this. Let me, let me show you this. Uh, a belt, right? People see Christianity like, like a belt. It's like, hey, if you don't act right, this right here is going to be used as this. And God going to whip your hind parts. How many guys going to whip with a belt much thicker than this? Raise your hand. Amen, somebody. Here we go. Yeah, you know. You know, was your mom the person that uh, helped you to go outside and clean off that switch real quick and uh, bring it back in the house? See, look, see, uh, see my, my mom was, was from down south, Louisiana, so uh, we know a little bit about, about that there. Um, so, uh, Bill, you know, we look at it as punishment. You know, if you don't act right, you get this way. Or some of us look at Christianity as a logbook. A logbook where God records all of our wrongs. Everything we do, God records it. And so when we get to heaven on that, that day, he's going to open up the John Normus IMAX theater screen and, and air all your dirty laundry in front of your grandmama. And you're going to be like, oh, Jesus, I didn't mean to, Lord, I'm sorry. But when we read inside the Bible, we can clearly see that God is love. And he talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> We look even further. Um, I don't have an example for this. This would be kind of too big to carry. But you guys ever been to um, to a theme park, and, or actually more of a carnival, and they have that little measuring thing. You got to be this tall in order to ride. Yeah. Sometimes we think Christianity is like that—that that we have to measure up in order to get to that place. Because the Bible talks about be holy because I am holy. And there's a lot of depth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. I'm not preaching against that at all. But sometimes we use that as a standard. That until you become this holy, you're not a part of the Jesus people, the Christians. And then I like to look at this. I use this one illustration one time. Just kind of imagine a picture on the screen and imagine the words, no fun zone, with a big cross in the, in the middle. <laughs> That's what we think. Christianity is a bunch of no fun, boring, stuck up, churchy, you know, wearing suit and tie people, whatever. It's no fun. But when I read the Bible, I like to think of Jesus as a party animal. Because the first place Jesus took his disciples was where? A wedding, right? First thing Jesus did as a miracle was what? Turn water into wine. Turn up! That's my thing. He's like, let's keep the party going. You know what I'm saying? So, Jesus party, man. And I like to think, you know, and this is my own interpretation. Of course, I'm being a little facetious. Just go with me. But I like to think Jesus took his disciples there before the journey because he wanted them just to kind of relax. Just to kind of get a chance to enjoy, get a chance to, to really see what this whole thing is going to be about. And so I, I want to talk to you guys that, you know, tonight I just want to take a few moments to, to really break down this idea that enjoying Jesus is not all about following a bunch of rules and restrictions. To be a Christian on a college campus doesn't mean that you have to keep a bunch of rules and restrictions. It goes a little bit deeper than that. I want to appeal to you guys and really say Christianity is not about rules and restrictions. It's about really embracing grace and accepting permission. 
You can tweet that later. I know, yeah, just put my name on side. <laughs> At Kyle Abney. Accepting, yeah, anyways. Anyway. So, but it's about embracing grace. Say this with me. Embracing grace. Embracing grace. grace. Accepting permission. Accepting permission. Now you're like, what in the world is this? So, let me, let me show you real quick. If you have your Bibles, you have your phones, you have some, turn to the book of Ephesians real quick. Uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 8 through 9. This is just such a really great passage of scripture uh, that Paul is writing to the Ephesian believers and he's talking about what it means to be made alive in Christ and uh, he just starts just going through a ton of great information but he gets this one part in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 through 9 if you don't have it yet and you're still trying to find it you know just kind of catch up with this when you can uh, and, and here's one thing too if you have a pen or a pencil or if you're using your, your phone you know you know highlight that bad boy I always kind of use this mantra this this model a messy Bible leads to a clean life yeah. Highlight your Bible, draw pictures in your Bible. You know, fellas, girls like a holy man. So, you know, tear the pages a little bit, make it look like you've been reading your Bible. Here it is. What's up, girls? <laughs> Bring your Bible with you to class. I don't know. I'm just. I'm, I'm, I'm ridiculous. Anyways, oh. Ephesians 2, uh, verse 8 through 9, it says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. That it, it is a gift or the gift of God, not by works. Let me read that again. I started too long. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. Somebody say works. 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 works so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are God's workmanship. I like another translation that says God's masterpiece. Yeah. We're God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Somebody say works. 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 works which God prepared in advance for us to do. When we break this down for a second, Paul is talking about the idea of salvation and how we acquire salvation. What I like to think is, and when you read this, you study this a little bit deeper, he says it's by, it's by faith that we've been saved. It's by God's grace through faith that we've been saved. Not by works so that men could boast. Because if, see, if, if it was works, if it was the things that we did, the rules and restrictions that we followed that got us salvation, then we could raise our hand and say, that was all me. Didn't really need you, Jesus, on that one. I got that one to church every single Sunday, and I became a deacon when I got older. I didn't party. Good Christian right here. Check my name off. But that's not what it's about. He says it's, it's not by our works so that men can boast, but it's by grace through faith. Because of God's grace, what Jesus did on the cross for us, all we have to do, per se, is have faith in that. But then he goes even further. So that's the embrace grace aspect. Embrace what God has done for us. But then he goes even further. He says, you are created as God's workmanship. Created for God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then you're probably like, wait, you just said you're not doing works. Like, that's not what it's about. No, it's, there's a difference now. Because, see, you've been saved through what Jesus did on the cross by your faith. And so now God is showing all of us in here, even before we made that decision to choose Jesus, he's already created each and every one of us inside of here to do good works. In other words, I'll break it down this way. It's not by works that we acquire faith, but by works that we inspire faith. The things that we do, God's created some good works for each and every one of us to do so that the faith that we have in Jesus can be shown through the actions and the way we live out. So it's just accepting that permission. God's given you full permission to do what he's already called you to do. You're not having to sit back and say, okay, Lord, um, I just feel called, you know, to the arts. And so I feel like you're, you know, I don't know how you want me to, to really, you know, share my faith through art. But God, this is, you know, I, I don't know. So I'm just going to wait for a calling. God's like, no, just start doing it. I've given you permission. Maybe you're called criminal justice. Whatever your degree plan is, you're saying, I think that's what God has called me to do in some way, shape, or form. God said, hey, embrace my grace because I've given you full permission and accept that permission and go forward and move forward in that. So it's not about rules and restrictions. It's about accepting grace and permission. And so getting a little bit further as we go through, I think that's just kind of a nugget to hold on to for a moment. But when we don't know that little bit of knowledge, we have this misconception of who God is. You know, we think he's got a belt up there. He's got a log book. You know, he's, he's like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I use the illustration all the time. He, he's like a uh, you know old man with a magnifying glass, like trying to burn ants, you know, like oh, I got you now, sucker, you know. <laughs> like he's just waiting for us to fail. 
We have this misconception. And so because of that, we give off this total wrong image of who God is. No wonder why it's not appealing. I wonder if people heard the message that when you read that Bible, if they heard the message that God loves them in spite of their sin, where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. In other words, Jesus has forgiven all of us in here for our past, present, and even future sins. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, before you even got into that sin that you got into yesterday, day before yesterday, or the one you'll get into next week, Jesus already died for you. He's already prepared. He's already made a way. So what does that mean? Paul talked about it. I'm getting all off the message, but I feel like this where God's taking me, so just let me go with it. But Paul talks about this whole idea of, hey, so, okay, what does that mean? I'm forgiven, so should I just party, turn up, twerk contest? What, what should I do? <laughs> wow. Hey, real light. Don't act like, you, you live on a college campus. Don't act like, y'all saw Miley Cyrus on the VMA. Don't act like. But, I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean we should just go out and do whatever we want? No, Paul's saying, man, no. It's God's goodness that draws men to repentance. When people know that knowledge, man, that doesn't make them want to just go out and go crazy. It makes them want to like, man, I, really? God, God wants me to, God, wait, God done, he's done what? That's some shocking knowledge for people. And so we have this misconception of God at times, and so we give up that misconception. And so I want to kind of go on this avenue here. People in the Bible enjoy being around Jesus. They loved being around Jesus. I mean, people flocked and followed Jesus. They would follow Jesus without even knowing where, his, where their next meal would come. Imagine feeding the 5,000. When you read, you ever, have you ever read the story of how Jesus called his disciples and wondered, like, he would just say, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. How is that appealing? <laughs> You're just like, okay, sure, no problem, let's go. It sounds weird. If a dude walked up today and said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I was just told there was something different about Jesus. There was something totally different about the way he carried himself. People weren't threatened or judged by him. They enjoyed his company. They wanted to hear what he had to tell them. They were intrigued. And even regardless of their social status, regardless of their dress, their appearance, even the way that they acted, Jesus showed value in every single person he met. Value to the leper. Value to the blind man. He valued every individual. And, and even in that same instance, there were people who were sinners, people who didn't have any respect for religious leaders that accepted Jesus. It's just kind of mind-boggling because how many, I'll just use this as an example, how many people in the streets who we all know may not be living the best lifestyle accept the pastor that is right down the street from them at that church in their neighborhood? How many of us Know people who look at Jesus and say, oh, man, yeah, I'm all about Jesus. I love Jesus. I want more of Jesus. And so they may say it with their mouth, but there's a really show with, with just their actions. And so just kind of getting into a little bit of a messy area. But the only people that, this is cool, the only people that Jesus was really harsh with is the religious people. The Pharisees. You read the Bible, man, he didn't, he didn't like, like call out the sinners and get mad at them. He called out the religious people because they were faking it. I'm like, oh, yes, Jesus, oh, yes, and they weren't really doing it. He's like, man, either you're going to not be with it or you're going to be with it. I'm like, just make your choice. Make your decision. So I want to read here uh, in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 9. It's a story of Jesus really just valuing people and how people wanted to be around him. And, and it's really, uh, to break this, this passage down, uh, Jesus is going to have a meal with, uh, with Matthew, the tax collector. And so... What's crazy about this, this whole story is that Jesus is going to hang out with some Jewish people. So they, they ate, they had their customs in certain ways. Then he was going to hang out with some Gentiles or some sinners that the Bible says here. And so one thing that's kind of interesting about this when you read this passage here, when they would go eat, when, when the, the uh, tax collectors and sinners, the way that they would, they would eat, they would fellowship, their culture was we would sit down and eat. And a lot of times they would recline back and eat, just kind of hang out and sit back in a lazy boy or whatever and just you know, throw down. <laughs> And then after that, they would get up and dance. They would just get up and party. Like, all right, we're done eight, let's get up and party. And so they invited Jesus, a holy man, a prophet, to come 
and I'm going to use the term again, to their twerk party. Like, <laughs> they're coming to their party. So they're like, hey, come and share a meal with us, and then come and party with us. So Jesus not only just went by himself, he brought his whole crew with him. So we got in Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 10 through uh, 13 here, it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, that's crazy, they invited him to his house. That's one of the most intimate places that we all, you know, we can think about. When you invite people over to your house, you know you got to trust them, right? So when Jesus was having dinner with Matt, uh, over at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus didn't even let his disciples answer. He was just straight up like, hold on, I, I got this. <laughs> on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, mm -hmm. but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I'm about to preach that right there. It's going to be good. Uh, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so we're going to break this down, man, because I think by the time we leave today, we're going to look at the term sinner in a totally different way. Because sinner is such a negative like, term that we just bash people with, and it's, ugh, it is so not appealing. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accurate term, but it's just not an appealing term. So I want to break that down a little bit today. But, so we see here, Jesus enjoyed hanging out with people who didn't really have a lot of respect for the religious people at that time and, and didn't really follow the, the Jewish laws or customs. And for whatever reason, they were sinners. The Bible doesn't say what they did. And so typically in those times, sinners were people who, you know, committed criminal crimes. Maybe they were prostitutes. Maybe there's people who just didn't obey the law. There's a ton of different ways we can look at them and say, hey, they just didn't measure up to what a holy standard would look like in those times. So, but for some reason, they accepted Jesus. They accepted him. Just chew on that for a second. Why in the world would a bunch of people see this holy man and accept him? And I like to think, I mean, you kind of look deeper in just the actions and the character of Jesus, is that he probably looked them directly in the eye and was willing to show them the attention and willing to show them that he cared about them more than any other religious leader of the church of that day. And that changed. They saw something different in him. Imagine if we all walked out of here tonight and we decided to change the way that we see those people who are not living right. And imagine if we saw the value. Imagine if we saw and spoke to the perfection in them that they may, they may not be living out right now. Imagine if there's somebody that you know in your dorm who's making all the wrong choices. But rather than judging them for their choices, you begin to start speaking blessing over them and salt value inside of them. And I, I bet you, I bet you it would change their, their idea of you and more importantly their idea of Jesus. Because what if we just showed love? What if people who are classified as sinners in our day started to see us different and started to invite us to where they hang out? Now, not everybody can go, and I'm going to share this story. When I, when I first got saved, I chose Jesus. I had a lot of friends who, uh, who did a lot of parties. And so I, I couldn't go to a lot of parties because I was like, hey, if I go in that atmosphere, it's just not going to help me. And, you know, I, I don't want to even get around that right now. So there was a, a, a point in time in my life where I had to separate that. Now, if I have people to ask me, sure, man, let's go. I'll go hang out with you. What's, what's going on there? And we're like, if I don't have a chance to sit on a chat with you, if I'm just going to stand against the wall while you do your thing, over there, no, I'll catch you later. <laughs> That's just not a really, it's not a chance for me to be light. It's just a chance for me to stand up against the wall. Yeah. So just, you know, I'm not, what, I'm, what I'm not trying to say today is, go out, party, do what you want to do. Jesus loves us. He forgives us all. Amen. Hallelujah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I am saying is, use that wisdom. Use what God has given. Use the blueprint of what Jesus did. And go about those situations trying to see value in others. And enjoy what Jesus is doing inside of you. Enjoy how Jesus is showing you to live your life. Enjoy how Jesus is, is giving you permission to go out and be salt and light, man. To go out and encourage a campus. To go out and encourage your friends. And maybe even, hey, this holiday season, to encourage some of those family members that you know need Jesus. How could this Christmas or this Thanksgiving be different by the way that you act towards them? So, I'm getting off track, but... He saw something in them, and so they, they noticed that. They, they just felt accepted. They felt like, man, for the first time, I feel wanted. I feel like somebody is really paying attention to me, somebody that's considered a holy individual. And have you ever felt like that? Like you just 
maybe like that where no one pays attention to you, that you look down upon, that you're unwanted. Have those moments where you're just like, and nobody cares. You can be around like you can be in, in a room full of people, but feel like you're so alone. Like, I'm just, I don't know what's going on. You can be studying, focusing on everything else in life, but you just feel so tired and worn out. See, Jesus liked to be around those people. He didn't just like being around those, you know, great, funny, happy church people that like to shout every three seconds. He wanted to be around the people who had some things going on in their lives because those were the people that could get his message. See, if we look at the Pharisees in the stories, the Pharisees act like they had it all together. Why does your teacher go and, and eat with those sinners? He's supposed to be a holy man. And, and to kind of give them a little bit of credit, because we always bash the Pharisees. In those day and age, he was Jewish. So in those days, Jewish men weren't supposed to affiliate with, with, with Gentiles or sinners in that way. Their custom of eating was a, a lot different. They, they got so, the Mosaic law didn't break it down to where they had to, you know, eat a certain way and do this and do that. But they added extra rules because they wanted to make sure that, that God would see them as holy. So for, to their credit, they're looking at Jesus like, he's supposed to be doing that. That's wrong. But Jesus looks at him and was like, man, you, you guys, you're trying so hard to manage your sin and to manage your image that you're forgetting the whole point of why God is called, what God is calling us to do. If you look back in the Old Testament, God positioned his people to be a holy people, to really be an example of how to live and go out and experience a blessed life. So the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, we got to the point where we wanted to just be seen as so holy, and we started wanting to be seen as this great and perfect image, this individual who looks so great on the outside, but on the inside, it's just toe up from the floor. So, Jesus wanted to be around those kind of people and Pharisees. They were judging. They were worried about their image. And I would even go as far as to say, if we're not careful, we can end up like those Pharisees, looking to just manage our sin, keep it in a little bubble, make sure that we look good when we go to church, still dealing with all this stuff. We can be looking to manage our sin and manage our image, but we'll miss allowing Jesus to really be our friend. And I know that sounds elementary. But when you begin to start having this mindset of, I'm not going to try to just live to please Jesus. I want to live to receive Jesus every day. Because when we wake up every day, and this is, uh, this is a, a revelation for me that was like, man, that's cute. When we wake up every day, we're saying, okay, how can I please God? Okay, so am I doing this right? Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I did this wrong. Oh, I did that. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I lusted. I dealt with this. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You know, I cheated on this. Oh, God, forgive me. And we keep going to this mindset of asking for forgiveness over and over and over and over again. We keep ourselves in this cycle of condemnation. We can never pull ourselves out of, but the Bible said there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So rather than living to please Jesus, we just live to receive Jesus. Wake up every morning and say, God, what do you have for me today? Yes. Hey, I, I, you know what? I messed up yesterday. I find myself doing this. I'll mess up in something, and I'll say, God, forgive me. Wait, you already forgive me. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. All right, do better, Kyle. God's on your side. He's for you, not against you. And that's an encouragement to keep moving forward. To enjoy Jesus, to know that he sees value in you the same way he sees value in those who are doing whatever they're doing in the world. And that may be some of us in here, man. We have some things we're struggling with. We're saying, God, I need help. on." So Jesus, and to kind of get back to this, I'm going to wrap it up soon. He says in verse 13 uh, to, to the Pharisees, he says, but go and learn what this, what this means. I desire mercy. Somebody say mercy. mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. That word mercy is a Greek word, aleos. It's a great, I, when Jesus said this, I'm like, man, that dude can preach. Uh, <laughs> I desire mercy. Basically, he said, I desire kindness or goodwill towards the afflicted. I desire to show God towards men. He said, you guys are looking at me saying, why are you going out to eat with them and hanging out with them like that, man? You, you, you're not looking like, you know, a holy man. You're not looking like a Christian. He's like, man, Learn this. My desire is for us Christians, for me, Jesus, to show God, to show mercy. I desire mercy. In other words, I desire to show God towards men. I desire to show goodwill towards those who are afflicted and hurting. More than I desire your praise and your sacrifice. More than I desire you to, because back in the Old Testament, when they would do something wrong, they would sacrifice. God, forgive me. 
Help me. Get right. He said, man, if you would put that on pause for a second and stop worrying about all the things you're doing wrong and everything and just go and show them the true God that we serve and be a living example, show them the joy, show them how you enjoy my presence, that would be something that could change and help these individuals rather than you pushing them out and outcasting them. See, to enjoy Jesus, you got to have some in joy. There has to be an inner joy. I love the scripture, the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So without the joy of the Lord, we're weak. Yeah. Nothing like a grumpy Christian. Yeah. Nothing like, man, God is good. <laughs> you sure, man? Yeah, man. Dude, my girl left me, man. I'm going to do You're freaking out like, man, okay, whoa, all right, we need to whoa, back up. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If we were grounded and, and put our foundation on the joy of God, on what he's done for us, going back to embracing grace, if that's our foundation, imagine how much strength we could have. Imagine how much light we could have. If we could just redirect and change our perspective from the works that we do in order for God to love us to the work that he did because he already loves us. Imagine how much strength and encouragement that would give. Jesus already paid it all. He's done it all. Stop trying to do it. Let them use you. Yes. God, how, what, what do you want me to do today, God? Find three people and just tell them God loves them. Or just, you know, just smile at everybody. I like to do this. I like to look people in the eye. <laughs> look them in the eye. I can't remember names for anything. <laughs> hey, what's up? What's your name? I look them right in the eye, smile at them, and then I'm like, man, what's their name? I forgot. <laughs> but for me, that's just a one little small way to kind of just show people I value what you're saying right now. Right. I want to value yeah. you for a second. And we have a longer conversation. Imagine what that could turn into. Amen. So just thinking through some of the ways. And that's just kind of a practical application. Think through some of the ways that you can show mercy to those who may be feeling afflicted. Yeah. That you can show God towards men. Because he wants us to do that more than he wants us to come in here and weep and wallow over all the things we're dealing with. Yeah. 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 Imagine if we just said, Lord, here's what I'm dealing with. But guess what? On the cross... You paid it all. So I give it to you. I don't see the victory just yet, but I know it's coming. So as I'm waiting for that, I'm going to go out, man, and still be who you call me to be. I'm going to go out with joy. I'm going to be so encouraged. I'm going to enjoy my relationship with you. Change the way people see God. So then he says, I didn't come to call the righteous, but call the sick. I like what Jesus said to them, man, because he's like, I'm not here to call the righteous, they Y'all good. You, you're doing a good job, man. Like, you may got a little hiccups here and there, but you're doing well. Like, hey, you, you, got, a, you got a good start. You're moving forward. You know, you're, you're obeying God's word. You know, you might be a little off here and there, but that's okay, man. Keep working. I came to focus on those who are really hurting, those who really need me. It's almost like for us, he said, hey, I, this is my own interpretation, kind of what God is speaking to me. Stop always just clumping together in your own little groups. And go find somebody who doesn't know God and just bring them in your group. Yeah. Just, hey, man, let's just show you what joy is all about. You know, let's just show you what, you know, Jesus is all about. Maybe they don't like the way you, you know, express your relationship with Jesus. Okay, that's fine. There's, there's a lot of different elements to look at. But Jesus is really saying to them, I don't want all this churchy stuff. I just want you to be real. If you enjoy me, people will see it. You ever hear like a certain song and you're driving in the car and you're just like, oh, that's a good song. But you hear that one song, you're like, oh, snap. Come on, man. You start dancing. The person in the back of the seat like, oh, you? You, know, you enjoy that song. You enjoy that music. People can tell. Well, especially when you pull up beside of them, on the side of them, you got a stoplight, you're over there jamming hard. You, look at, you ever somebody just look at you while you're jamming for a second? And then you done jamming, you're like, oh. Just chill. That's kind of, I, I look at it like that. If we enjoy Jesus, people just look at us like, what in the world is wrong with you? <laughs> but rather than like stopping, we just be like, hey, turn it up loud. <laughs> you got to just share that with others. <laughs> so he said, I mean, the righteous are doing fine. It's the sinners. Now, here's, here's what I want to get to. We're going to wrap this up here. The sinners. Oh, this is so good. You know what sin really means at its simple definition? To miss the mark. Sin means just to miss the mark. Sin means just to miss the mark. That's basically just saying, hey, 
Sinners are people who just constantly miss the mark because they haven't been told the great message of what Jesus has done. They just miss the mark. That's it. That's like you taking a bow and arrow and you shooting a hundred times. You just can't hit that bullseye. So they labeled you as, hey, you failed a bunch of times. You missed the mark. God is, I mean, of course God doesn't like that, but he's not like, oh, I hate them. <laughs> no. <laughs> he's looking at us like, hey, they just missed the mark, man. You guys have the answer. The problem with the church is, is that we have the answer, but we want to go, and this is what with, I can preach this all day. But the problem with the church is, is that we have this answer, but we just want everybody else to get it in the package that we deliver it. In other words, this is, here's the answer. God's like, hey, if you just, you know, the church saying, if you praise your way through it, to praise your way through it, if I could break that down in the simplest term, it's basically to say, hey, man, just give God, you know, glory and just be encouraged even in the midst of what you're going through. But the church is like, in order for people to get that, we got to get them to come to the altar, to tarry, to throw up, to cry real hard, to stand up on their feet, to come in their Sunday's best, to praise God this way, to shout like this. You know, that method, that's the only way we expect people to get the truth. Yeah. But Jesus said, hey, man, this is just people who miss the mark. Just tell them. Just tell them, hey, you don't have to keep that. Are you, are you struggling with that? Do you like that? No? I used to carry this burden all the time that I had, every person I ran into, I had to tell them about Jesus. And I would be like, oh, if I didn't tell them, I would go home like, oh, God, I missed it. I messed up. I quit. Like, I just, I'll be so mad. I went to community college for like a year, and I used to carry this exact Bible around. I feel like I just, if I, didn't, if I need to carry my Bible around so people can see it and they can just know Jesus. I look more like a weirdo than I did anything. It wasn't attractive at all. Think about the ways that you can just live it. God's not putting this huge burden on you. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Light. Stop being so heavy and like, oh, God, I got to do all, oh, oh, oh my, I got to go, I got to preach to everybody, and I got to just chill and enjoy Jesus. You, when, when you get around some people, just don't feel like, okay, how am I going to tell them about the Lord? What is it going to, just, just be you. See, I, I don't really believe this, and in, in, in being married and having, you know, being with my wife for, for, couple years now, I know this, if my relationship with my wife is not going that great, it's because my relationship with God probably isn't going that great. Mm. Yes. And so if your personal relationship with God is maybe lacking a little bit, maybe you're not spending a little bit of time in prayer, you know, however that looks, I'm not going to say spend 30 minutes for 20 days and it's going to be great. <laughs> I'm just, whatever it is, if that time probably isn't right, then it's probably going to be shown amongst people. And you're going to be like, man, why am I not seeing fruit? Well, you know, it starts here. Yeah. It starts with you. Enjoy Jesus. So sinners are not people that are, oh, they're totally bad, they're rotten, they're poor, they're failures, they're going to hell. Mm. Well, it's people who miss the mark. Is hell a destination? Yeah, it is. But man, if you enjoy Jesus, you probably could save a lot of people yeah. Yeah. from going there. Mm. 